reading list is going around. Need eight readers tonight, so if you're so inclined, we could uh, sure use your talents. It's a marvelous thing to be literate. Might as well put it to use. Oh, by the way, we're in the ninth chapter of Luke tonight. Plan is to continue this class into the next quarter, since we probably won't finish the gospel tonight, seeing as how there's 24 chapters, and we're starting in nine. Are there any parts of this gospel that we've uh, not covered well enough to your satisfaction, is there anything you want to go back to? Questions or observations you want to make? I always ask that while the list is going around. Yeah, give Jared one of those. Good, yeah. Pass them out. There's only... Only eight sections. Does it have a divider? Was that the last one, Peggy? All right, super. You're handy to have around for a number of reasons. By the way, I sure hope Renee gets some relief from those shingles. That's how long has she had them? Wow. Is this her first time? Mm. It's not good. All right. Well, if nobody's got anything, whoever's got the first. Assigned reading, let's go.
Did anybody get 57 through 62? Okay, we're good. little bit longer than we normally have. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter. He calls the 12 together, 12 apostles, and what does he do? If you can look, it's all right. <coughs> Excuse me. He gives them power and authority. What kind of power and authority? Wouldn't that be great? How would you like to have that today? I mean, we don't typically run into demons like they evidently did in the first century, but how often do we come in contact with diseases? Doc? Wouldn't that be nice? Instead of just looking at symptoms and trying to figure out based on symptoms what's wrong with the person to just, you don't even need to know what they've got. Just put a hand on them and say, all right, you're healed. How would your practice grow? And people would know, you need to see Doc. He's now, what if you're not even a doctor? What if you're, you're just some guy who used to be a fisherman in Galilee, and you're going into these towns, and you're, you're talking to people about the, the coming kingdom? Oh, what is it about? What do you know about the kingdom? You're just a fisherman from Galilee. Well, here, let me fix that leg that fell off three years ago, and it's done. That kind of power is what Jesus is giving these 12. And there were demons in those days that were afflicting people. Obviously, there's, there's an account of one here, which is interesting to me because it says Jesus, look at verse 1. He gave them power and authority over what? Over all the demons. So he's given them that. That's what Luke is writing and telling us about here in the first verse. What happens later that he rebukes his apostles for? They, there's a demon that they don't cast out. And, and he doesn't say, oh, that's okay, guys, no big deal. This is a really bad one. What's he say to them? What's wrong with your faith? Where's your faith? It, it's, it's as if, and I don't mean to read too much into this, but he knows he's given them the authority to do it, and they're not doing it. And it's easy for me to read this and say, yeah, those dumb apostles, what was wrong with them? They had the authority, they had the power to do it, but they didn't do it. But then I started looking at Marty Kessler in the mirror. Well, what things could Marty Kessler be doing that I have authority to do as a Christian, as a human being, and I'm not doing them? So if I'm not doing what I could be doing, how can I be critical of others who have the authority to do things and, and they're not doing it? Anyway, that's trying to make some application out of this, and it's not hard. It's not hard. What does he tell these guys as he sends them out? Don't take anything with you. What are they supposed to be doing? What's the whole purpose in sending them out? Re rely on him. But in verse 2, he says, I'm sending you out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. He says, take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, nor credit cards, uh, do not even have two tunics apiece. What did you pack the last time you were going away for a weekend? More than that. Man, we got to have just, just in cosmetics. And I'm talking about mine. <laughs> I mean, it, 
toothpaste and uh, the cocoa oil, coconut grease, whatever that stuff is. Uh, I mean, the stuff you do that with, uh, you, you got to have a bag for your stuff, man. And Jesus says, listen, I'm sending you guys out, and I want you to proclaim the kingdom. You don't worry about taking stuff with you. What, what's supposed to happen where they go? The laborer is worthy of his hire. Now, that's not what he says here, but that's essentially what he's telling them to practice. You go into a town, and if you're received in a house, stay there as long as they'll receive you. Don't you think it won't be a blessing to that house for receiving these whom Jesus sends out? What if the house or the city doesn't receive you? Shake off the dust of your feet. Now, to me and to you, this may not mean so much. But according to secular sources, this was huge for the Jews. Because when they traveled outside of Israel and then returned, when they got to the border of their homeland, they would shake the dust off of their feet from those heathen, pagan, idolatrous, godless lands when they would step on the holy ground of Israel. That's, that was their practice. The Israelites knew that. So if, if that's true, it makes good sense to me why Jesus would say to them, you shake the dust off of your feet just as if those homes that won't receive this news of the kingdom are like the heathen pagans out in Paganville. To me, that's what he's telling these guys to do. So it, it wouldn't have been just a simple uh, passing disfavor. It would have been a big deal. Shake the dust off your feet. What's he say in verse 5? As a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Wouldn't you have liked to have gone behind them and seen all the things that they did? And then, verse 7, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening. He was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. Was that right? You can answer. It was not right. It was said by some that Elijah had appeared. Was that right? That was not right. Others said that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Was that right? No. Is there a lesson there? You better check your sources. <laughs> if, you, if you say much on the internet, you better know that's true. Because there's all kinds of goofy stuff. I, I even read something the other day. Uh, uh, how did it go? In, information received on the internet is subject to... calculating disposition or something like that and I, that had to be true because it was signed Abraham Lincoln so uh, yeah check everything these folks were wrong they were making observations they didn't have it right they didn't have their facts straight Herod was the tetrarch uh, tetrarch you've probably seen that term before anybody know what it means the, what's that he, he was a ruler uh Four areas were divided up, and he was a ruler over one of those. That's what a tetrarch was, a ruler over a, a four, one section of a four-section area. Herod said, verse 9, I myself had John beheaded, but who's this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him. This is verse 10 of all they had done, taking with him or taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this. They followed him. And how did Jesus respond to the crowds? He welcomed them. And he been, began talking to them about the kingdom. He's doing exactly what he sent them out to do. And what else did he do? What he sent them out to do, he is now doing. He's talking to them about the kingdom. He is healing them. And it turns out day was, was ending. The 12 came and they said, hey, better send this, this bunch away. Uh, why would they need to send them away? 
they need, there's a McDonald's down the road. They need to go get something to eat. And uh, Jesus said, sit them down. We're going to feed them a happy meal right here. What did he use? What were his resources? Five loaves of bread. Of course, we could debate all night on how large those fish were. But I don't think they were big enough to feed 5,000 people without God's help. But with God's help, that's all he needed. So the next time Marty Kessler is faced with a challenge and he doesn't think he's right for it, Marty Kessler needs to remind himself, well, Jesus fed 5,000 with a few loaves and a couple of fish, five loaves to be exact. So maybe God could do whatever he's given Marty Kessler to do, or maybe Marty Kessler can do with God's help whatever God's given him to do, even though it doesn't look like Marty Kessler's enough. Or when we look at situations and we're praying to God about situations and it's hard for us to believe how God could make any kind of a difference, we need to come back and remind ourselves we're, we're not talking about people who have our limited resources and our limited strengths. We're, we're talking about God whose resources and strengths are not limited. How many did he feed? 5,000 men. How many women and children? I have no idea. But that's a lot of people. And it's interesting, it says he, he had them to sit down by 50s, groups of 50. He had a plan. And it says in verse 16, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them, which little parenthetical statement here, good reason for us to always give thanks before we eat. Gratitude is never out of place. And then it says in verse 16, he kept giving them to the disciples. This is a New American Standard. How do some of your translations read there? How do you keep on giving two fish and five loaves of bread? Okay. No, it's all right. We love getting off track in this class. Oh, okay. I believe it's the second. It's that it's multiplied. And I think verse 16 bears it out. <clears throat> yeah. It, when it says he kept giving it, even if he was taking little tiny pieces, just like we do, you know, when the crackers passed around Sunday morning, some people, you know, the, the smaller the piece you get, the holier you are. Uh, I think some folks think like that. And other folks think just the opposite. Take half that thing, boy. And, uh, and that's, that's fine. What's, what's the scriptural size of a piece of unleavened bread? <laughs> Sharon? <laughs> well.
You could never prove it, but but you have us. I believe that. So they ate and they were satisfied after Jesus kept giving this food out. And it says in verse 17, that the broken pieces they had left over were 12 baskets worth. That's a lot of leftover pieces from two fish and uh, five loaves. That's, that's pretty good economy right there. Now, I'm not trying to get political. Well, I don't think they did here. They just had them. They, they had the fresh stuff, and then they just had leftovers when the fresh stuff was over. I guess they could have got out some Ziploc baggies and carried it along with them. But Yeah, you got to wonder what happened to those 12 baskets. Uh, anyway, here, put some of this bread in your pocket. Yes. When God wants to bless an economy, he can do it whether or not our economists know everything they need to know or not. If, if God wants to bless a people with prosperity, he will do it regardless of how much focus we've put on our economy. I, I think about this in every election year because that's one of the things that always comes up. How many people are out of work? How many... Uh, dollars are we spending to get our nation in debt? And the answer is always the same. It's just like the simple bumper sticker or license plate that says Jesus is the answer. If we would return to God as a nation, all these problems would be taken care of. I'm not saying that God would magically come down on a, on a big pink cloud and, and solve everything like the, the magic dust fairy some people believe he is. But I'm saying he has a way of blessing us that we can't even imagine. And when he takes two fish and five loaves and he feeds 5,000 people and there's 12 baskets left over, tell me he can't do that with a nation's economy if the nation humbles itself and turns back to him. That's, that's the way he works and he does that all the time. And he never does what we would expect. He always does beyond what we would expect. Verse 18. The, the meal is over, everybody's eaten, everybody's full. So while he was praying alone, verse 18, the disciples were with him. He questioned them, and he asked, who do people say that I am? Does, does 19 sound familiar? We just read that a little while ago, didn't we? Some say John the Baptist. Okay. Others say Elijah. Others say one of the prophets. And they were all wrong. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Luke doesn't record the exact words that Matthew records here. What Matthew records Jesus telling Peter is, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but who has? My Father who's in heaven. If God tells us something, you can take it to the bank. But if we're listening to the world, we, we're probably going to get bad information. Because Jesus was not John the Baptist. He wasn't Elijah. He wasn't one of the other prophets. He was Jesus. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. People were missing that. But Peter knew. And even though Peter knew, did Peter do some dumb stuff? Oh, yeah. He knew. And he was committed. And he still did dumb stuff. There's hope for us. There's hope for us. He's about to do some dumb stuff. Just let's keep reading. Verse 23. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he's got to deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. To follow me. What's it mean to take up your cross? Yeah, 
that? What happened on a cross? What? Well, when, when you mention a cross in this culture, what happened on crosses? People died. People died. When Jesus says, take up your cross, he's saying, you've got to die. How often do you have to die? Every day. Every day. Jesus is not talking about individual burdens that we bear. We have those, and those are a reality. But when he says, you take up your cross every day, he's saying, you need to die every day. Just like if we were saying, you take up your hangman's noose or your electric chair or your uh, mixture of drugs, although I don't like to use that one because it doesn't always work. Uh, I can make it work. <laughs> I, 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 that sounds horrible to say that. But I keep coming back to Romans 13 where Paul writes under inspiration that the government does not bear the sword for nothing. People are supposed to be afraid. And the, the things we do with that are, are not what they ought to be. Dayton? Yes, and when you put that thought together with what Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, which is, is where he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, nevertheless, I live, because everybody knew if you were crucified, you're dead. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, and it comes back to these works. So the works that I'm doing don't reflect Marty Kessler because Marty Kessler wouldn't be about those works. Marty Kessler would be about, at best, hunting and fishing all the time to the neglect of family, to the neglect of marriage, to the neglect of everything, hunting and fishing. That's what I would care about. I guess there's a possibility some way out there in the future I could get sick of it. Probably not. But that would reflect Marty Kessler. Marty Kessler doesn't do that all the time because I'm crucified with Christ. You don't do what you would do all the time because you are crucified with Christ. You take responsibility for living the kind of life that you believe God would have you to live. And that might include getting up every day and taking care of your children. It might include getting up and going to work. It might include getting up and going to school. But you're going to do what you believe God would have you to do because you are crucified with Christ. Now, other people might do the same kinds of things, but they will do them for different motivations. They'll do them for money. They'll do them because they have to, because somebody's going to make me do this, or, or whatever. But when you do it for Christ, because you are crucified with him, you're living out what Jesus is saying here. You're taking up your cross. You're dying to yourself on that cross. You're being crucified every day, crucifying yourself so that Christ can live in you. That's huge. And don't think that it's a small thing to God for us to do that. This is what he teaches us. And when he says us, sees us living by faith this way, it's, it's huge. We are reenacting with every day of our lives the life that his son came to show us and his, his final death. Yes. Yes. Um, 1 Corinthians 3. 
know we've got a ways to go in Acts 9, but I mean Luke 9. And it's, I think we've talked about uh, Romans 12 before. Let your, let your mind be translated. Did I, I, for 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 3. Verses 17 and 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the Lord is, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. We're being changed. We get up every morning. We live a life of self-crucifixion to live as God would have us to live, as his son, and we're being transformed. As people look at us, they don't see Marty Kessler. They don't see Steve Howes, they don't see Jason, they, don't, they, they see Christ living in us. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. There's power in that. That's what the world needs to see. And the world probably won't listen to us until they see that in us. But once they see that in us, there's a good chance that they'll listen. Yes, demon possession. Uh, I don't know, but I don't want it. Yes. Yes. Now, why would people see good works in you and glorify God? Why don't they see good works in you and glorify you? We all know ourselves, and so we kind of know each other. And we know nobody does something for nothing. And if we see somebody so motivated to be self-sacrificially good is that the right way to say that there must be some power behind that I I have envy over those people who have the willpower to be uh, to eat the right things yeah <laughs> and really it's it's not about eating I can eat the right things it's just that I like to have it with a side of uh, cinnamon rolls and, and donuts with chocolate syrup and sprinkles and a box of cereal for dessert. Uh, yeah, what's wrong with that? Really, and die happy. And the same thing is true spiritually of, of all this physical food that we talk about. The same thing is true spiritually. What do we take in spiritually? How, how are we nourished spiritually? And the things we feed on Intellectually, academically, spiritually, those are the things that feed our souls. If we're feeding on the word of God, it's going to feed our soul. If we feed on logic and reason that, that God has given us to use in this universe, it's going to feed our soul because logic and reason will always lead us back to God. Always does. C.S. Lewis, see if I can remember this quote. Any line of reasoning that invalidates reason hey, I think I wrote it down, is it in itself unreasonable. Yeah, really. Who was that? Slim Jim? What was that guy's name on Hee Haw? <laughs> Hee Haw, you've seen, you haven't seen Hee Haw, you're just a kid. You've seen Hee Haw? Ah, no line of reasoning can be valid that invalidates reason. Yeah. How did I get off on this? I don't know. But it's good stuff. C.S. Lewis said that. Oh, that can't be. Um, verse 24. 
Seems backwards. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. How are you going to lose it? Where are you going to lose it? You're going to lose it on that cross. You're going to lose it on the cross that you take up daily because you're going to lose it on that cross. You're going to die on that cross. You're going to die to yourself. But if you lose it, what's going to happen? You're going to save it. He's going to give it back to you forever. Eternity. What man? What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Uh, who were the big shakers and movers of our nation's industrial revolution? Who started uh, the big shipping industry that brought so much wealth into this country? His name was Vanderbilt. Who established the, the great oil fields? Who's that? Rockefeller did. Who was the, the big investment banker that made so much money and helped industry get going? What's that? Where are these guys? They're all dead. J.P. Morgan? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> It's usually the way it works, isn't it? They're dead. How much power did they have when they were alive? Man, they had power. They had money. Even with all that power and all that money, all that influence, there were still great limitations that they had. And one of those limitations is you cannot prolong your life. Even uh, Kansas said that. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in all your money can another moment by. Dust in the wind. Now, I don't agree with that philosophy necessarily. I think it's a lot more hopeful than that. But when they said that about money, it's very true. But if you give yourself up for the Lord, <laughs> more than the universe, it becomes ours. Yes. I'm still learning the, the lesson of my garage, because here's what happens. My garage is my workshop, and every time I get it clean, Debbie says, could, could you put some shelves over here? <laughs> okay, now I've got to go buy lumber, and I always buy no more lumber than I need, because you never want to have too little lumber. Well, now you've got to have a place to store the lumber that's left over, and you never seem to have left over what you need for the next project, so you just keep accumulating lumber, and when you buy the things that go with that because you always need more hardware. You usually get more hardware than you need for projects like that. You got more hardware left over. I go into my garage and I say, man, I wish you didn't have this stuff. It's, it's, a, it's accumulation in my garage. It just, it's constantly getting in the way. But what, what, am I, what am I willing to get rid of? Oh, man, I can't let go of that because I might need that in my next project. And this, I can't. I got to find a place to store that because I, can, I just know as soon as I let that go. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm building barns right there in my garage. Yeah. I know. It's just exactly like that. Because everybody has that same experience. We've, we've. On the other hand, when I do box up some stuff and say, I have got to get rid of this, just giving away a box of junk is like a weight lifted. <gasps> <laughs> Why are you laughing, Pete? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Jesus says, what's a man profited if he gains the whole world and, and has it in his garage, but he loses his soul? Even while you have the world, it doesn't give you peace. Jesus did not say, come unto me and I'll make sure you've got enough money so that you'll have peace. He didn't say, come unto me and I'll make sure that your prosperity grows so that you'll never be unhappy in life. He said, come unto me, take up your cross every single day, die to yourself, and I'll give you your life. All right, we've got to quit because that's the bell. Um, memorize the rest of chapter 9 for next week, and we'll come back and... Do chapter 10. It'll be a test.
Yeah. <laughs> you, you can. I bet you could. I didn't think I could memorize the Sermon on the Mount, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to come these three days, but I didn't have time. But I'm making time to work. Hey, I tell you what, I understand. You don't have to. You don't have to explain to us. I tell you what, it's run, 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 run. run. Yeah. But Marty, I tell you what. You know, I've made a ton of knives. Yeah. Never, never come on one. Never put my name on one. Only charge one guy for making a 28-inch Bowie knife. And I didn't let it take his money. Took me five diamond stones to whittle it out. Is that yeah. a, it was out of a metal brake blade. <laughs> the other, That's the a other story night, right there. The other night, man told me, get out of here. <laughs> I made it for him. Huh. And he was tickled. He was a reenactor. Yeah. At Fort Reno. Oh, yeah. Carried an old dragoon on one side and an eight pound Bowie knife on the other. Eight pound? You'll see the, deer, the elk horn I used. Good night. You'll see the brass I put on it. Then his wife took an elk skin and beaded the whole thing with a strap over to hold it up so it wouldn't the pants would fall off. <laughs> yeah. Eight pounds would drag it. That's like a like a. And he said, "I got to do the crocodile Dundee." He said, "No boy stuck that thing." Like, what do you think about? He said, "I've been waiting for this." <laughs> he said, "Rich enough to pull that sucker out of his ears." Yeah. He said, "That's not the guy said, where did you get <laughs> him two grand for it? You're kidding. Man. You have seen it. It was gorgeous. Mm. But anyway, you got to come over. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, if I can talk uh, Clee into it, we're going to go out and get some lunch tomorrow. But he's got a rifle. Uh, it's an old German rifle. Okay. It's, I, I don't think it's got the original lock. Okay. But it was it's a, uh, lock or a, it's it, a, it's a percussion. Rifle. Jaeger, yeah, that's Jaeger. what it is. Okay, yeah. And I don't know if he's ever really had it appraised. I've got, I've got a book. It may I could have, I could, I might. Cover me now. <laughs> she, run, <laughs> she runs with some bad company. Do you see what he's doing? Yeah, I saw. <laughs> he tells you what that's about, doesn't he? What? Save one eye so you don't go blind in both of them. Oh, no. But see, <laughs> what did I tell you last Sunday? You're the best accessory that little oh. bony, scrawny sucker could have. Yeah. You make him look good. He needs all the help he can get, <laughs> just like his daddy. <laughs> well, I've said my piece. <laughs> Marty, see you tomorrow. See ya. Hey, looking forward to it. You know where my house is? I've been there. Yeah, okay, just it's down 59 from Westminster. Yeah, so okay. Half a mile south, you see a little road that only goes back to that to Levisy. Mm -hmm. Turn down that first driveway on your left. You see a, a tan building out there? Doors open. I'm in there. You're in the tan building. All right. That's my shop. You got any dogs? Willie would Willie will lick you to death. <laughs> he's okay. A, he's a weenie dog. I'll have Pete get out first. <laughs> or uh, uh, Cleve.